congratulations, Tom, on 50 years in show business. If it weren't for you, I would not be here. I definitely walked in the path that you shined a light on. And uh, I patterned myself in no small way on you. And uh, you're the greatest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Rush. Thank you so much for coming. We're gonna have some fun tonight. I've got some of my favorite people, and my favorite players in the whole wide world. And it's gonna get hot tonight. Well, it's gonna get hot tonight. The moon is shining bright. I can tell by the size of the stars in your eyes It's gonna get hot tonight Come on, let's go downtown Come on, let's mess around Put your hair up white and wear your dress too tight It's gonna get hot tonight Yeah, it's gonna get hot tonight, baby The moon is shining bright I wanted to do the finale for the 50 years at Symphony Hall because a couple of reasons, but Symphony Hall set up pop style that really is magic. Gonna fuss and fight and scratch and bite and it's gonna get hot tonight. Whoa, it's gonna get hot tonight. The moon is shining bright. Gonna fuss and fight and scratch and bite and it's gonna get hot tonight. Oh, that scotch and soda so fine. I did some shows there in the early 80s. And it was kind of the end of a, a bit of doldrums in my career. My dreams go tumbling with the dust Out across the valley Low above the river Low above the sea Life's a sparrow lost at sea In dark of night with far to go Dreams are ships that sail away And we are only cargo Only cargo I'm an adopted kid, and like all adopted kids, you know, I was curious about who my genetic family might be. Now the sea <clears throat> wondering when, if someday my true parents, the king and queen, would come to claim me. I am born a farmer, raised the same, and married to the land. I went to the family lawyer in Concord, New Hampshire, and said, I'd like to find out if there's a way to connect me with the genetic family. And the lawyer said, well, I, uh, I'll ask uh, the probate judge. And so then I was uh, called in to see the probate judge, whose name was Donald Cushing. And he said that he thought he knew my mother's family. Finally, Judge Cushing called me back and said, well, I understand you're a fine young man and uh, I've done a lot of good things, but I can't help you, goodbye. Hung up. I thought, well, that's very odd. But I had learned that, the, that my mother's family lived in Franklin, New Hampshire. And, and I'd learned that their name was Varney. And so I called up the, uh, the Varney sister and I said, hi, you don't know me, but apparently I'm Barbara Varney's son. And she said, oh, and she was so happy to hear from me, and, and it was great. But Barbara had died. And I asked, do you have any idea who my, my father is? And there was this pause, and she said, well, there's actually some debate about that. And she gave me the names of two guys. And the first guy, I mean, you can imagine the kind of conversation, hi, you don't know me, but... I'm Barbara Varney's kid. And he cut me off before I could even finish the sentence. He said, I'm not the guy you're after. I said, well, how about this other name? 
And he said, Dad, he's the guy. He's the guy you want. Well, the other name was, was Larry Cushing. And this actually explains a lot about why Judge Cushing dropped me like a hot potato. It was his brother who turned out to be my dad. I called Larry Cushing then and said, hi, I'm Barbara Varney's kid. And he said, oh, and he was so happy to hear from me. And then I saw him, he, he moved to Florida, and I saw him a couple of times down in Florida before he passed away not too long ago. I was adopted by Dick and Molly Rush from Concord, New Hampshire. My adoptive family's history goes way back. Ancestors on both sides signed the Declaration of Independence. Dr. Benjamin Rush on my father's side and Richard Stockton on my mother's side. Ben Rush, Dr. Ben, um, was not only a signer of the Declaration, he was, he was an important person in the, uh, in the medical world and in Philadelphia in particular. He's regarded as the father of uh, psychiatry because he was one of the first people to say, you know, these people that you're locking up in the basement and locking up in the attic could actually be treated and helped to, uh, you know, to lead a, a normal life. But he also provided Lewis and Clark with a lot of their medications when they were headed out on their expedition, one of which was a, uh, a laxative. It was actually, uh, I think it was a patented medicine. They were called Dr. Rush's Bilious Pills. Um, it contained a lot of mercury, and the, the troops on the expedition referred to them as thunderclappers. And today, archaeologists trying to trace the route of Lewis and Clark's expedition can still find mercury in the soil at their campsites and thereby confirm that this was a, a Lewis and Clark campsite. So I come from New Hampshire. You betcha. I was born in Portsmouth, and raised in Concord. I was raised at St. Paul's School, so I actually grew up in 18th century England. My father taught at St. Paul's School. He was a math teacher there. Guys come up to me uh, after shows and say, your dad was my, a teacher of mine at St. Paul's School and he changed my life. He was one of those teachers who changed people's lives, which is really nice to hear. Anyway, I grew up at St. Paul's School as a faculty brat. This is the pond. The pond is very special. The pond is where all the skating took place. One of my dad's jobs was to go out on the ice. He was a hockey coach, but he was also the ice tester. You go out on the ice with a hockey stick when the ice was first freezing and bang on the ice to see if it was strong enough for the kids to go skating. So I learned to skate before I could walk, literally. I was a pretty good skater, but I did not like hockey because playing hockey with these big kids, I was getting high sticked in the face all the time without them having to high stick. You know, they could just be holding their hockey stick normally and I'd run into it with my face. And, you know, these pucks whizzing around and, and these guys would, you know, also throw snowballs very, very hard. And they would hurt when they hit. And I developed an abiding aversion to sports involving projectiles or cudgels of any kind. And when I got to Harvard, you were required to participate in a sport. And I said to the Dean of Sweat, I said, I will not, no sports involving projectiles or sticks or things that will hit me. And he somehow talked me into going out for fencing because I left out stabbing. Stabbing was not on my list. And so I studied fencing for a while. My parents had a lot of uh, different recordings around and some of them I loved, some of them I didn't care for. But Paul Robeson, uh, I loved his voice. And when I was, you know, when I was eight, I wanted to sing like Paul Robeson. And he was, of course, an operatic baritone. Way down yonder in the middle of the field, angel working at the time field. Not so particular about working at the wheel. Just want to see how the time field. Now let me fly. And it's very hard for him for an eight-year-old to deliver that, that stuff. So that didn't, it didn't work out well, but uh, 
but I was really impressed with what he could do with his voice, how he could evoke feelings and tell a story with his voice. Pete Seeger was another one that they had some recordings of in The Weavers. So Robeson impressed me early on with the potential for using the voice to convey emotions and convey stories. I decided that music was cool. Piano, classical piano, I, I gave up on, but my cousin Bo taught me the ukulele, and then I got a guitar, and then the late 50s rock and roll thing was happening, and so I got... Uh, got an electric guitar and, uh, you know, tried to play all that Gene Vincent, uh, you know, Chuck Berry, Elvis Presley stuff, Everly Brothers. And I had a little band at school. It can be argued that my, my musical career actually started not at the Club 47 or any of those other coffee houses in Boston, but at the, at the Concord State Hospital. Behind me is what used to be the Concord State Hospital, the New Hampshire Mental Institution, at the corner of Fruit Street and Pleasant Street. And among all the stuff that my mom had to do, uh, she found time to volunteer at the Concord State Hospital. She ran the bookmobile, brought books around to the patients. And one day, someone there was saying, you know, we've got a lot of musicians in the inmate population. And mom's little eyes lit up. And my boy Tommy, and I'm 16 years old, headed down to the state hospital with my little cardboard guitar case to, to organize a band of inmates. And at that age, at 16, you don't know what's weird. You don't. You don't. At 16, everything's weird. And, and you try to be cool. Oh, yeah, organize a band of inmates. I do it all the time. Oh. But looking back on it, this was a profoundly strange experience. <laughs> and it was, it was in this context that I organized my first band. And it probably, it doesn't mean a thing. It's just, it's coincidence. But as chance would have it, all, of, all the musicians were in the forensics wing, in the, <laughs> the criminally insane. And I had an ax murderer on lead guitar an arsonist on drums. Nobody knew what the bass player was in for because he never spoke. <laughs> Seldom played the same song as the rest of us. <laughs> but looking back on it, they weren't that different from other bands that I've had. <laughs> Except they were on time for rehearsals. north by the ice-bound ocean I was born I was born way up north in the Merrimack County that's my home that's my home we took a road trip my family and I across the country we were driving I think we we're driving to California but we stopped in Wyoming we stopped in Jackson Hole at Betty Woolsey's ranch and Betty had some Josh White recordings and I was just thunderstruck by this guy Josh White because I'd never heard a guitar played like that I'd never heard songs like that just fit the battle of Jericho 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 just fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down you may talk about your kings of Gideon you may talk about your men of Saul but there's none like the good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho that morning just fit the battle of Jericho, I loved it and I decided instead of Paul Robeson I wanted to be Josh White that didn't work out well either but uh, but I from that point point on started digging into the folk music side of things. And when I got to Cambridge, uh, everybody was really into the, the pure 
ethnic, gritty stuff. And I was told that Josh White was commercial, and that was bad. I still like Josh White, although I didn't talk about it as much anymore. And I went to see him a couple of times. He was a consummate performer. I mean, he had, he had his show down. <clears throat> so slick. He'd take a cigarette and he'd stick it, you know, upright behind his ear. Pray tell me where you bound. He was a cabaret performer and he had an act. He was not a, you know, a sharecropper or a coal miner or a, you know, somebody who made his own fiddle. Uh, this was a, a show that he put on. And that was partly why I think uh, the folkies, the purists, didn't like him because they really, they like the, the sharecroppers and the, and the chain gang prisoners and the people who made their own instruments and uh, stuff like that, because it was more real, and it was. It was for sure, and Josh had this, this you know, high gloss to his presentation that was off-putting to some of these, some of these people. And, uh, but I, you know, I, I have a show. San Francisco Bay There's an ocean line that took us so far away And I didn't mean to treat us so bad She's the best girl I ever have had Said goodbye and made me cry And I'm gonna lay right down and die Well, I ain't got a nickel It changes, a but uh, I have honed the material uh, to where it really feels feels right, feels good, and, and it works. Walking with my baby down by the San Francisco Bay. Walking with my baby down by the San Francisco Bay. So we're in the uh, study hall at Groton School, where I went to school from eighth grade through 12th. My recollection is that I was not consulted on this. You know, this is a decision made from above, and I was expected to comply, and so I did. I guess it was the blue blood thing going on in the background, but uh, my mom's family, and I suspect my dad's as well, pretty much lost the money in the Depression. So they had, they had the manners, they had the silverware, but they didn't have the money. Behind it, I mean, they, they, we weren't uh, impoverished by any stretch, but um, but it, we, you know, we're not wealthy either. Uh, I think the word was comfortable back then. There were kids here in my class and above and below me who were, you know, from the from the huge money families. So I never felt, you know, I was part of the upper crust. I was, you know colleagues and schoolmates with these guys, but, uh, you know, they'd go off grouse shooting in Scotland for Thanksgiving weekend, and I didn't do that. I was accepted at Harvard, and I think Princeton and North Carolina were the three I applied to. And I decided I was going to go to North Carolina, and my dad, uh, who was the college advisor to hundreds of St. Paul students, kept saying, no, it's your decision, Tom. It's up to you. You do what you want. And uh, I said, OK, I'm going to go to North Carolina. And he basically said, no, you're not. You're going to Harvard. This is Levert House, where I spent my last three years at Harvard right in that, through that door up the flight and to the left with three roommates. I had this little radio show on Harvard's station, WHRB, a Wednesday night, I think, 30-minute show called Balladeers. I had some, some, some name people come on. Pete Seeger was one of my guests. Jesse Lone Cat Fuller was one of my guests. Baez came on one time. The folkies were quite separate from the classical music crowd and the jazz crowd. Uh, we were regarded as, you know, wild-haired kooks, pretty much, which I think is accurate. And this is Mount Auburn Street, which is, of course, all different. Nothing stays the same for very long, but this is where the club used to be. 
Club 47. And it was a very convenient stroll from my dorm room at Levert House. Big plate glass windows on the, on the street, which would all be fogged up in the wintertime. Uh, the cold air and all the people inside breathing, steaming up the place. And uh, it'd be a little spot that was wiped clean and you could look in, and see what was going on. Depending on who was playing, if Baez was playing, there'd be a line down the block. But, uh, you know, if I was playing, there might, might not be. It just depended on the night. But it was, a, it was a cool scene. And I've, I've always felt that making people wait outside, especially in the rain or the snow, is a good thing. Because then they're really committed to liking the show. They would feel so stupid if they waited in the rain and didn't like the show. So they're much better audience. Make them wait. Of course, part of what the Club 47 was really good at was bringing in the legends, whether it was bluegrass legends. They also brought in a lot of the old blues guys. Jeff Mulder was part of that scene. We used to follow these guys around, and Jeff in particular would follow them around, write down everything they said. There was this one night when there were these two old blind blues guys giving separate concerts in different parts of town. And Jeff got all excited and he said, I got it, we're gonna invite these two guys, okay? We're gonna get them and we're gonna invite them to this party at my house, my apartment. And, and neither one's gonna know the other one's coming and they're gonna get there and they're gonna be surprised and they'll sit down and play blues and blues history will be made right there in my kitchen. He was so cute. And it didn't work. Um, the guys showed up, they, they actually came to the party which surprised me. So they came to the party, they were surprised, they sat down in his kitchen, so far so good. What we didn't know was they hated each other <laughs> and had for a long time. And these two old, these two legends are sitting in his, these chairs in, in Jeff's kitchen yelling insults back and forth. <laughs> and the English majors, myself, are all going, what do you do? The legends are fighting. And it got, it got really nasty. It got very heated and, and nasty. And one of these guys finally leapt to his feet, knocked over his chair and whipped out a razor said he's gonna cut the other guy up. Now, these guys are both blind, okay? <laughs> and in their 80s. The other guy jumps up, knocks over his chair, and pulls out a pistol, a pistol, and said, and I quote, make a noise. <laughs> too exciting for me. I went home and studied for a Chaucer exam. But neither of those guys was Sleepy John. He was a sweet fellow. And this is his song. You drop down, mama, let you daddy see you got something there, baby, keeps on worrying me. My mama don't allow me to fool around all night long. She said, you might be too young, son. Some woman might treat you wrong. So this is where the Golden Vanity used to be. In those days, early 60s, it was kind of a rundown, shabby, industrial neighborhood. And the Vanity was on that side of the street. It had like these double warehouse kind of doors, ironclad doors that, that opened. And I would come down here to go to the Hoots, the open mics, looking for guests who appear on my Balladeers radio show. And uh, this is where I discovered you could get in for free if you had a guitar. And then I discovered you could get in for free if you had a guitar case. And so I'd come down to the Hoots, I'd put a six pack in the guitar case and head on down to the Hoot. And, uh, try to find artists that were willing to come onto my radio show. And one night, I got caught. I was, uh, I'd gotten in for free, but they ran out of performers before they ran out of time. And they said, hey, you kid, get on stage. You got in for nothing. So I borrowed a guitar, got up. I don't remember what I did. I was so nervous. But apparently it went over well enough that Carl Bowers, the proprietor, called me up a couple of weeks later and said somebody was sick, the performer was sick, and could I come in and do a show? And so for a while I was kind of the substitute folk singer for the Golden Vanity. 
and it kind of went downhill from there. Now you see me coming through your man outdoors. I ain't no stranger, I've been here before. My mama don't allow me, honey, to fool around late at night. So this is apparently where the salamander used to be, my first paying gig, one Huntington Avenue. It's obviously changed a whole lot. Daddy, see you got some there, little girl keeps on worrying me. My mama don't allow me, honey, to fool around all night long. I'm having trouble with the notion that this Apple store is actually the site now of what used to be the Unicorn Coffee House run by Byron Leonardos, who gave me my first regular gig before he moved over to the Club 47 in Cambridge and took me with him. Hey, treat you wrong. I've been playing now for, you know, for maybe a, a year or so on stage and, uh, I had a couple of people ask me if I wanted to make a record and nothing ever came of it. And uh, Danny Flickinger came into the Unicorn and asked if I'd like to make a record. And I said, well, sure, not expecting anything to come of it. But he showed up the next week. I, I had a weekly gig there. And Danny came in with this tape recorder the size of a washing machine. It was a huge thing and trundled it down the steps into the unicorn and he recorded two nights. I don't care when you go, child. I don't care how long you stay. I don't care when you go. I don't care how long you stay. And that was the album. He, he said it was, uh, <laughs> it was morally indefensible to intersplice it, to intercut, you know, take the first half of a song from night one and the second half from night two. I learned later that uh, it was because he didn't know how to edit tape. So they're all complete takes, for better or for worse, sometimes for worse. But uh, that was the first, the first album. He had it pressed and he distributed it out of the back of his car back seat of his car, got it in some stores around town. It was an interesting milestone because most of my contemporaries didn't have albums out, and I did. And never mind that it was quasi, it wasn't really a vanity thing. I mean, somebody else paid for it and invested in it and made it happen, but it wasn't a real label. There were no other albums on the Lycornu label. But nonetheless, I had an LP out in the stores and nobody else did. You do me that way, mama, don't drive my, my love away. Paul Rothschild was kind of a regular at the Club 47, and he forged some kind of a relationship with Prestige Records, where he was uh, authorized to you know, sign up artists and make records for Prestige. And uh, he made a lot of, he made records with several of uh, my contemporaries. And the fact is between Vanguard Records and Prestige Records, just about everybody who could play a six string guitar inside Route 128 had made a record except me, except for the, that I already made the, you know, that Unicorn album. But I couldn't get signed to a real label. And I was, it was starting to hurt my feelings. And, uh, Finally, Paul came to his senses and decided to, to ask me to make an album for Prestige, and we did. So we're on Acorn Street on Beacon Hill, and this is the street where the cover shot for that first Prestige album was, was taken. Byron Leonardos scouted all of Boston for locations, and we we picked this one. A guy had a living room studio here. And this is very low tech. This is before uh, 
any of the fancy stuff came along, but he had one microphone in the middle of the room. The wire from the microphone ran down the stairs to the kitchen where he sat in front of his Ampex 601 tape recorder that had one knob, volume. And uh, it, was, it was crude but effective. If you wanted the bass player louder, you moved him closer to the microphone. Problem solved. No equalization, no tone control. So if you wanted a brighter sound, he'd come upstairs and roll the rug back a little bit. Worked great. Then Paul jumped over to, to Electra Records, and I really wanted to go with him because I liked working with him. Paul Rothschild came from a musical family. I knew that he was close to Tom Rush, and I knew that Tom had already had one album out on Prestige and uh, was scheduled to do another one, but I wanted Tom Rush, and I knew the key to Tom Rush was Paul Rothschild. We were able to extract Tom from Prestige as long as Tom did one more album. Uh, he wanted Paul to produce it. Prestige didn't want Paul. Tom went out. Paul did produce the album. And then a week later, they came back to the studio to do the Electra album. Song about a train called the Panama Limited. Panama Limited is a train that runs from Chicago down to New Orleans. It's what they call a special streamlined train. That means she's fast. That train's so fast. The hobos don't mess with that train. They just stand by the track with their hat in their hands. Now, I'm sure they gave the weaker material to Prestige and saved the better material, like Panama Limited, for the Tom Rush on Electra album. And that's what happened. Hey, hey, yeah. Tom had exquisite guitar craftsmanship. He was an impeccable musician, and he was totally comfortable in his own skin, no matter what genre of American folk music he was dealing with. The first Tom Rush album was one I'm still proud of and one I still listen to. My guess he heard those breaks, she jumped up. One last time, said, Dad, you know and I hate to go. Hey, may never see your face no more. Tom was best of class and would lead and inspire ultimately many other artists on the label. And I woke up today and found Frost perched on the town It hovered in a frozen sky And gobbled summer down And when the sun turns traitor cold And shivering trees are standing In a naked road Get the urge for going And I never seem to go The urge for going, which I first and heard Joni do the night I met her at the Chess Mate in Detroit and fell in love with the song instantly. I recorded a uh, kind of a pilot recording, a demo for Elektra before we went into the studio to do the Circle Game album. And I made, I don't know if it was a mistake or not in retrospect, but I gave a tape of this to Dick Summer. I was in at the radio station, WBZ. And for people who don't know about WBZ, it's a monster. Uh, they're in Boston. And I had an air check once from some guys on Midway Island in the Pacific. A bunch of guys from Boston who were stationed out there and they used to listen to me every night because it was a sound from home. And at the time, we played anything we wanted to. Um, WBZ was a very powerful radio station. A very popular one, but uh, there really was no format. You played what you wanted to play on the air. So people would bring tapes in, whatever, and we'd listen to them, and if we liked them, we would play them. And 
Tom came in and he's this lanky kid, big shock of light brown hair, wearing a, an old blue pea coat and sneakers and jeans that looked like it had been handed down from his great-great-grandfather. And he's telling me about this girl that he met. She writes this incredible music. And I got a tape here of one of, the, one of her songs. So I took the tape into the station to play on the tape recorder. And I, it took me a week to get my eyes closed. And it was the urge for going. They've got the urge for going. got the wings to go and they get the urge for gold when the meadow grass is turning brown and so if you wanted to hear this song which was not on in stores you couldn't get it any other way you had to call the station and they got a ton of calls for it and it became known as what was known as a turntable hit. There was no product, but people wanted to hear it, so they kept playing what they, and it became known as the tape. And it was a, it became a big, uh, a big deal. The result of which was that when the album finally came out and the single came out, it went to number one on WBZ, and no other station in the Northeast would touch it because it was so identified with that one station. And she gets the urge for gold When the meadow grass is turning brown and all her empires are falling down Winter closing in What was so impressive about it, in retrospect, is that he nailed the singer-songwriter thing by including Jackson Brown, Joni Mitchell, and a song by uh, James Taylor before anybody had heard of these people. All the... Let's put it another way. He hit the trifecta with his ability to pick great songs. He always had that ability to pick the best material. And he was a terrific arranger for Tom. I, I gave uh, a Tom a demo of, uh, um, I just, recorded it on a, on a quarter track tape machine. And I left the country, I had been, basically nobody had picked up on my thing. I, I tried to get Electra interested, but there wasn't any response. So um, I went to visit friends in England and ended up being signed by, by uh, Apple Records over there. You know, uh, that would have been around the same time that uh, that Tom back in the States was making Circle Game and putting my song on it. It was sort of a pleasant surprise to come back to the United States and find out that he'd cut the song, so that was great. You know, anything like that when you're noticed by and picked up on by an established act like that, it really puts some wind in your sails, you know, to do that. Also, to, to be included in the other writers on that uh, on that album, Joni Mitchell and, and Jackson Brown, were, it, was, uh, it, it was some early attention. I was asked in an interview recently if, uh, if I kept in touch with Jackson Brown and Joni Mitchell and James Taylor. And I said, well, no, we don't, you know, we don't go bowling all the time or anything, but <laughs> I see him once in a while, and I started thinking about it, and I realized once, once in a while means every you know, two or three decades. <laughs> and the example that came to mind was that this is early, late, late, early 70s, late 60s, I can't remember, in Cambridge. And I don't know if I went to Jackson's show or if he came to mind, but the upshot was that we ended up back in my hotel room with one girl between us. <laughs> and it was a tense situation. <laughs> Very tense. And uh, we're both putting our best moves on this poor girl. And, Nobody seems to be making any headway. So finally, after about an hour of this, Jackson gets up and announces, well, I guess I'll be going now. He said it two or three times, actually. And the <laughs> girl didn't rise to the bait, so he left feeling rather dejected. And then about 20 minutes later, the girl left, leaving me feeling rather dejected. <laughs> so then fast forward, 15 years, and we're out in the Arizona desert, 
doing a benefit concert, and we're out at this beautiful natural amphitheater. And Jackson's is finishing up his sound check. We said, haven't said hello yet. I haven't done my sound check yet. And the security guards come running up and say, everybody get under that trailer right now. There's a sniper up on the rim rock. And the sniper turned out to be a drunk with a shotgun and he passed out by the time they got to him. But you know, they, they thought it was a threat. So we all go piling under this trailer and I slid in next to Jackson. And he looks at me and I look at him. And instead of hello, he says, you remember that girl? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, did she? I said, no. I said, I said, he said, oh, how you been? In my putting my own act together and presenting myself, Tom, is the is definitely the model for it, without any question more than anyone else. His uh, presence on stage, the way he presented himself, it was easy, it was conversational, it was, uh, it, it was uh, matter of fact and, and, and very, uh, it was humble, you know, I mean, it wasn't blown up. It was just very accessible, very, very much about the music, about the material. Um, it was, it was I, I loved seeing him perform. I still do. But I'll ply the fire with kindling And pull the blankets to my chin And I'll lock the vagrant winter out And bolt my wandering in Over and over and over, I get defined in terms of these other artists, um, which is which is a shame, but in, in in some sense is inevitable because when the evening news is doing a piece or when the magazine is doing a piece, they've only got so much time, so much space, and they want to put in some some names. They want to put in some recognizable names, and there they are. But uh, you know, artistically, I I don't think I'm. I'm defined by them uh, at all. Although I, you know, I love the, I love the songs. Um, I love a lot of songs, and that's part of you know. Th those songs are part of my musical family, but not all of it. And I get the urge for gold when the meadow grass is turning brown. Summertime is a falling. The Circle Game album has this little credit on it that says Concept, Tom Rush, which always <laughs> leads to questions. <laughs> what concept? It's very subtle, it's buried a little bit, but basically the sequence of songs, in my mind at least, is the, portrays the evolution of a love affair. And it uh, starts with Tin Angel, Joni's Tin Angel, where she find, found someone to love today and it ends with no regrets where the love affair breaks apart. guy. Tom is like an onion in a way. It's a lot of layers. And sometimes you peel some of those layers and you start to cry. And then sometimes you cry so hard you start to laugh. Guys who are always weeping, 
you know, the, 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 the tear loses its effect. But when you're trying not to, and it happens anyway, and you're a guy, you know, and every guy is taught, no, oh, big boys don't cry. Um, that, that's, that's where the power is. And it probably also explains some of the reason why he is who he is to us. Say goodbye. I try to achieve an intimacy with the song and with the audience. And that there's stories, you know, I think at the, at the bottom of it all, I'm a storyteller. And so I try to tell whatever story the song contains, I try to tell it in, in a way that's, that gives it immediacy, it gives it, you know, connects it to the audience where the audience can say, oh, I know what, I know what the person in that song is feeling. And I try to, you know, I try to actually get out of the way of the song and connect the song and the audience and just be sort of a, a lens through which the song goes to get to the audience. I think there must be an autobiographical connection in any song that I relate to or that, or that you relate to, the audience relates to. I mean, if it doesn't ring true, if it doesn't have some, something in it that you can say, oh yeah, I've, I know what that guy's talking about. I know what the person in the song is feeling. I know I've been there. Uh, the song doesn't work. Who knows? what was going on in, in Tom's life and, and inside his head and in his heart on some of the nights that he was standing singing No Regrets. I'm not really trying to reveal a lot about myself, although I suppose that happens in my selection of material and the way I deliver it. Uh, but that's, uh, I'm not consciously looking for that or uh, planning for that. There are recurring themes. There's a lot of water in the songs that I write, and, and I think loss, you know, saying, especially personal loss, losing, losing a person, a kid leaving home, or losing a love um, is a recurring theme um, that I respond to, or I wouldn't be doing the songs, or writing the songs. I think wandering, the wandering theme is, you know, because of being a, a traveling musician, being on the road so much, you kind of wish you could be in one place for a while, be settled down, be home. But then, when you are home, you get the itch to, to go out and wander some more. So there's this, you know, push and pull between the, between the poles on that one. Jack Holzman at Elektra was getting more and more into the rock and roll side of things, the Doors in particular, understandably. And when my contract came up for renewal, he said he would renew the contract, but he wouldn't improve upon it. And Columbia uh, was willing to give me a substantial raise, basically make a, make a much better deal. 
they were a much bigger company with, with greater reach. So I made four albums for them. Goodbye, Mama. Goodbye to you too, Pa. Little sister, you'll have to wait a while to come along. Goodbye to this house and all its memories. We just got too old to say we're wrong. Trevor Beach was introduced to me by Bernie Fiedler, who ran the Riverboat Coffee House in Toronto, where I met Murray McLaughlin and learned the child song, which just floored me. And I knew I had to do that. I knew I had to do that song. It's just so true, so honest, so. It's a very, one of the striking things to me about Child's Song is that so few people, so few other artists have done it. And I was puzzled by that for the longest time because it is such a strong song. And the reason is it's very, very hard to do because it, it is so naked and honest. Um, anyway, I had, trouble, I had trouble doing it for the longest time, for you know months and months. I couldn't perform it because I would burst into tears halfway through, it was such a, had such an emotional impact on me. And it, I finally toughened up enough that I can deliver it, but it's still, you know, I, you know, every time I do that song, you know, somebody is, is in tears in the audience. And Father, you have taught me well, goodbye. And goodbye, Mama, and goodbye to you too, Pa. Columbia was, you know, the big industrial thing, but they had union engineers. And just about the time everybody felt like doing that magic third take that was gonna be it, all the engineers would go out on coffee break. And my contract was up because they did not send me a renewal notice on time. So I said, ha, I'm out of here. Columbia came back and said, no, 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 no. We meant to send you the uh, renewal notice. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll extend the original contract by one album. And we made that album, Ladies Love Outlaws. You know, I think they did a good job for me, but uh, we never got to the breakthrough that they were looking for. I was traveling pretty hard in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. There was a a stretch where I was on the road. Well, I was working, I think uh, I had, in a five-year stretch, I had 10 days off, not in a row. But every other day I was rehearsing or, you know, doing gigs or traveling to gigs or doing promotion stuff or, you know, one thing or another. And uh, I was getting, getting pretty, pretty burned out. I was living in New York City and a lot of my friends there were moving to L.A because that was where the action was. And I thought, well, I really want to be where the action isn't. So I think I'll go back to, back to New England. And I, every time I came up to do shows, which is pretty often, I'd spend an afternoon or two looking at real estate. And finally, after a couple of years of this, uh, I was driving through town here and uh, asked a local realtor, what do you got? And he said, well, we got this listing, just came on this morning. And uh, so he brought me up here and I just instantly fell in love with the place. It was a little further away from Boston than I wanted to be, a little further from the uh, turnpikes, but, uh, but it was, you know, the view, the house was terrific, the view was terrific. I just, it was love at first sight. So I made an offer, they accepted it and uh, you know, like the next day, the deal was done. It was very, uh, very abrupt. And uh, so I moved up here from New York and, uh, you know, I kept traveling, kept gigging. I put in a studio over the garage, which is now gone. It sort of became my, my home base artistically as well as, you know, where I lived. 
Beverly, my first wife, moved in and we, we had our first boy, Benjamin, in 1975. Richard arrived in 83 and we had some good years here. And I finally, after, in some, somewhere around 75, I decided I was gonna quit showbiz and be a farmer, which <laughs> didn't work out, but left, left me with an enduring respect for people who actually are farmers and can make a go of it. I needed a tractor, so I went down to Peterborough and went to a dealership down there, and I said, well, what's that? And they said, oh, it's, it's made in Russia. It's a Russian tractor. But he did a good job selling it to me, and uh, I figured, well, this looks like a real tractor. What do I know? But it looks like a real tractor, so I bought it. And she was great. She. Uh, she never let me down, and I got all kinds of implements to go with her, including a, a bog harrow, this great huge harrow that you used to chew up sod. And I chewed up a field down below, and I planted it in uh, American sweet clover, which the bees love. And I figured, well, I've got honeybees that will make good use of it. And uh, it grows about this tall, and it's great. Uh, you know, green fertilizer, you, you plow it under, you disc it under. Well, the part that I missed was you have to disc it under before the stems turn woody. This, they turn very fibrous at one point. So I've got this American sweet clover that's six feet tall infested with bees. So I can't do this during the daytime. I've got to go out after the bees have gone to bed with my lights on. And this disc harrow is chewing up the American sweet clover, basically turning it into a huge ball of twine. And I get about 10 yards and I'd have to stop and get out and cut this stuff off of the disc harrow and then go another 10 yards and do it again. It was, it was excruciating. Well, I am going on a journey and I pray all things end well while Mother Earth provides for me. I will pay faithfully. I fenced in a couple of fields up top and figured, well, what we need here is livestock to keep the keep everything eaten down. And so I got uh, a local guy, or several local guys actually, who needed places to graze their livestock to bring over. I had I had mules, I had a couple of cows, a few cows, and a couple of bulls with horns this wide, giant giant bulls and the bulls kept getting out and uh, the farmer I'd call I called him up and he'd come and get them and put them back in but they'd end up down on the down on the road or in the neighbor's yard or and he had this he'd get a bucket of of uh, feed and he'd lure them back into the in, through the gate and close the gate again and we'd be okay for a while I called him one time and he wasn't there and I figured well I know how he does it. So I, I didn't have any feed, but I had some bird seed. I figured they, they won't know, they're bulls. So I got this bucket of bird seed and was luring them and they started actually trotting after me and then running after me. And I was panting back up the hill through the gate, threw the bucket out ahead of me and they went charging for the bucket. And I then figured out, wait a minute. This is bird seed. And they came after me and I made it through the gate and closed it just in the nick of time. Green trees grow on mountain tops. Birds still sing while morning comes. Though I treat her carelessly, Mother Earth provides for me. And over there, is where the beehives were. I had four beehives at one point. So I had this bee helmet 
with this coarse screening that would keep the bees out. And I had this, you know, the white suit with the gloves that came up to here with the elastic on them. I had the whole thing, the, you know, elastic around my pant legs. And I came down and uh, this was a particularly nasty bunch of bees. And they could see me coming. And they'd start getting upset before I even got there. And by the time I was about 50 feet away, I was just covered with really angry bees. And, you know, I was wondering, I was pondering whether I should continue on and open the hive and meet 10,000 more of their relatives, or if I should just go back to the house and get a can of Raid and show these bugs who's boss. But that, as I was standing there pondering this, that's when the black flies arrived. And the black flies had no trouble whatsoever coming through the screen that was keeping the bees away from my face. And so I had, very quickly, I had a face covered with black flies feasting on my tender flesh. And I couldn't take the helmet off to get at them because then the bees would get in. And the only thing I could do was take refuge in the pond, which I did, and <laughs> waited for things to, to calm down. And I decided that I wasn't cut out to be a beekeeper either. Mother Earth provides for me. Mother Earth provides for me. That lasted for about nine months, my retirement. And I decided I wanted to get back on the road again. Uh, not full time, not anything like I was doing before, but just, a, you know, a gig here, a gig there. And so I started booking myself. Locked my door as the sun went down. Said goodbye to Boston town. Mass turned back to Route 15. Head me on down to the New York Sea. Humming of the tires, sure is pretty. Think about the women in New York City on the road again. The industry was going through all kinds of changes. Uh, you know, I didn't have a record deal. Couldn't get a record deal. And I'd been playing every Christmas time, between Christmas and New Year's, I'd been playing in Boston. The last time I played the Paradise, a fella came in, a college student, he said, I'm doing my thesis and I'd like to do it on you. And could we do a survey of your audience? So we gave the audience a written survey. And it was, I looked out between the curtains at, at halftime and they're all, it looked like a, an exam room. They're all out there studiously, God bless them, filling out their little little surveys and uh, it gave me for the first time a good idea of who my audience was and they were mainly professional people but it seemed to me that these people would like to go to Symphony Hall I'd been asking Symphony Hall if they would open up for me and so finally in I think it was 1980 they agreed to give this dumb kid a shot and open up And it did very, very well. It sold out. And everybody, including myself, was, was stunned. There were a bunch of young artists coming along at that point that uh, obviously could use some help. So I thought, well, as long as I'm booking some, you know, somebody, myself, I might as well, you know, try to get some gigs for these other people too. So little by little, this turned into a booking agency, which was called Maple Hill. And we were, we were a booking agency, we were a publishing house, we were, we were kind of a management company as much as a booking agency, because I was, you know, trying to, trying to develop careers for these, for these youngsters and uh, not just get them gigs for the most possible money. Everything we did was for a reason. The Crane's Crest paper that we used was to send a specific message about our professionalism. Uh, the font that we used, our press packets were put together in a way that um, I had to wear white gloves to assemble them so that I wouldn't leave any fingerprints and they would be covered in a seal so that part of uh, the process of, of 
getting the information on Maple Hill production was sort of like opening a present. And so Tom was very uh, persnickety. And it was all very, uh, it was all very gratifying and, and fun, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't making a lot of money. I was going out on weekends and playing gigs to really support Maple Hill instead of Maple Hill supporting me. And it was taking up a lot of time. And, and I remember at one point I, I played a gig and broke a string on the last chord of the last song, a string broke. And then I didn't have any gigs for three weeks. And I got to the next gig three weeks later and I opened the guitar case and the string was still broken. And I thought, uh, oh, something's wrong with this picture. And so about that time, the fire happened. So this is my buddy, Peter Beard. He's the road agent. Peter's also the guy that spotted when the house was burning. He was out on the Deering water fishing and he saw the house, paddled ashore and called it in. And it probably would have been a lot worse if he hadn't done that. Well, I was fishing with my brother on the pond. We was fishing and drinking. I didn't know that part. Yeah, we was fishing and drinking beer. We weren't catching no fish. We were drinking <laughs> a lot of beer. But I looked up on the hill and I said, holy Christ, look at that fire. Where is that? And it didn't take us long to deduce the only thing you could see from the lake was your house and there was a, an addition right here. Yeah. Or a, a man, it went up as high as, a, high as a peak and the flames were 40 feet higher than that. It was, a, it was a great glow in the sky. So we paddled ashore, which took a time. And then we got in my truck and, and drove finished to the, the beer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah and then got to the highway garage, the nearest phone, of course I had no key, so I kicked the door down, and got wow. in and called the fire department, <laughs> and then I was a fireman at the time, so I went to the fire station, got in my tanker, and up we came. You can put your fire out. So I had just driven out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming to join Renee Askins, my love, who was out there working on Yellowstone wolf recovery, and I felt quite certain that she needed my help. This is 1990, before cell phones. And so I got a call at 12 o'clock at night from the local fire department saying, Tom Rush's house is on fire. And we needed to find Tom. And it took us 24 hours. He and Renee were out backpacking uh, deep in the woods in Wyoming. I think Tom was trying to decide if his home base was gonna be in New Hampshire or if it was gonna be in Wyoming and we eventually decided to pack up Maple Hill Productions, and that's where Tom uh, called home for uh, the next several years. At first, we lived in a log house down right next to the Snake River, and later on, we moved to another log home at the foot of Shadow Mountain, and Renee and I got married in 1995, and our daughter, Sienna, was born in 1999. So this is a song, I think it's a song about living next to the Snake River that summer. It's called The River Song. Now the gypsies know my future, but the angels know my past. I rolled all around this great wide world To find a love to last I'm weary from my wandering Lord, I'm, I'm wounded in the war I'll lay me low where the willows grow Listen to that river song I pretty much stopped working with a band most of the shows I do these days are solo, which, uh, which I really enjoy. For one thing, it's, uh, I'm, I'm kind of cutting back on my, on my traveling. I'm trying to get it down to one weekend a month. And the problem with having a band is, you see, bands want to get paid every week. It's, it's a, I regard this as a character flaw, but, but they, they really insist on that. And I don't want to work every week, so... I am very blessed in that I can be a solo act. Now I know the heart has reasons that reason cannot know. River runs by my window. River runs by my door. River runs so sweet. My 
never roam no more Might never roam no more out there in a few minutes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. In the early 80s, I was basically told by the record industry there was no market for my kind of music, and I just didn't think that was right. So I started making albums on my own and selling them by mail order, dealing directly with my audience. And that process had the result of actually giving me names and addresses for some of these people. And uh, we kept in touch. From there, when the internet came along, it became much, much easier and, a, and way, way cheaper to keep in touch with these folks through email. But it also opened up a, much more of a two-way conversation. I now send out newsletters occasionally and I get a lot of emails back. And people, people you know, feel like, feel like they know me, which is great. Signing stuff for people after shows, very, very often I'll say, who should I sign this for? And the person will say, oh, it's for me. And then I'll have to say, I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten your name, or you know, how do you spell that? Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thanks for coming again. Uh -huh. Vicky, V-I-C-K-I. Okay. To Rich. <clears throat> Rich, okay. Is that you? That's me. It's great that they feel that, uh, you know, that they're my buddies. And they are. They've been paying my rent for 50 years, so God bless them. I first heard you do that song, Panama Lemonade, Club 47, in 1963. Thank you. Sir. Thanks for coming back. As good as ever. Well, thank you, sir. Who's this for? To Stephen Mary. Jean. When we were talking about, you know, well, how should we cap this 50 years? I said it would be great if we could get Symphony Hall. I felt because of the the history of being there in the 80s and selling out all these shows and people remembering them with great fondness, and the 50 years between the two of those, we should be able to sell out one night. So we booked it, and. Then the question was, well, how are we gonna, how are we gonna pull this off? And uh, decided to try a Kickstarter campaign, which I'd never, I had no experience with. I had no idea if this was gonna work or not, but it did work. So anyway, Kickstarter took care of it. And uh, all, the, all the money's in place, we can go ahead and do it. If nobody buys another ticket, we don't get hurt. And apparently our campaign was the fifth most successful music campaign that Kickstarter's done. Just came up on the midnight special. Hey, how about that? My car broke down in Texas. Stopped dead in her tracks. I just called to tell you. That I love you I just called to tell you On how I feel I feel like 
some old engine and lost my driving wheel and I feel like some old engine I lost my driving wheel The shows have always incorporated, um, combined well-known artists, established artists with newcomers, musically compatible newcomers, so that I can coerce them into doing songs together and, and mixing it up and doing stuff that wouldn't happen in their regular show. They are a conduit, hopefully, for the newcomers to reach a, a wider audience. Um, I think Dom Flemons in this show they're, they're, you know, the chocolate drops are very, very successful, but I suspect that 80% of the people in that crowd that night didn't know him, but now they love him. From a selfish, personal point of view, if it had just been, if I put it together a show with myself and Judy Collins and David Bromberg and Arlo Guthrie, it's a nostalgia show. If I put in a couple of kids, it's not. And it somehow, you know, all of a sudden, the camera draws back and you have a wider, a wider view of the music scene. And so giving a context to the music, it came, it came from here, here it is now, this is where it might be going, um, somehow makes it more rich and fulfilling and entertaining. not far from here and it was kind of kicks for my wife and I to go and see him you know after so long and I expected some kind of an old man to come out on stage and he says he's better than ever he does a show it's a stand-up all by himself just Tom and a guitar he's got people right there in the palm of his hand for that two and a half hours and just when you realize, I don't know how many guys his age can stand up for two, two and a half hours, <laughs> let alone do that kind of a performance, you know? The rusty old mill now is still Maggie. I think he was so seminal, so central to that folk music movement in a way uh, it was genuine, and, and it, was, uh, it was spontaneous, and it, was, um, uh, it, it grew out of something that was really there, you know. Uh, there was very little hype to it, and that epitomizes Tom, you know. He just, uh, I think he didn't make the translation into, uh, in, into uh, uh, to bullshit and hype, you know. They say I am feeble with age, man. He's persisted in doing it exactly the way he wants to do it. That's the way an artist should be. That's the way a record company should be run. He is doing it his way and he makes no compromises and I cannot think of anything more admirable in a man or an artist. My face is a well. It's been an interesting, a very, very interesting ride. Some parts of it a bit like a, a luge run, some like a balloon ride, some like a wallowing neck deep through a swamp, but uh, it's never been dull, and I can't wait to see where it goes next.
standing in the field Getting old and red A lot of misery in Georgetown There's three men lying dead Joshua's head of the government He said strike for better pay The cane cutters are striking Joshua's gone away Joshua gone Barbados Staying in a big hotel The people on St. Vincent Got many sad tales to tell Sugar mill owner told a striker don't need you to cut my cane Bring in another bunch of fellas You strike me all in vain You get a bunch of tough fellas Bring them from Zion Hill You know somebody'll get killed 